some older people now, like myself, in the Briary Gap Choir. Um, you should come along and listen to us. We're not bad at all for our first outing. It'll be an interesting experience, and we're singing some nice tunes and songs that people will know and be very familiar with indeed. Now, for Lent, we promised you a Lenten reflection, and um, we're going to continue with that now. of the building site where he was supposed to be working and halfway up he slipped. There he was in the ground and not a stone or anything. And then two of his friends were there looking at him. He was motionless. And says one to the other, I wonder is there much wrong with him? I don't know, says the other, but one thing is certain, he's after getting the hell of a twist. And you'd say to me, what has that to do with Lent? Well, it is all about turning ourselves, twisting ourselves back to the God who's crazy about us. He's mad about each one of us by name. Mad about us when we're good and when we're bad. He has an almighty love for you. There, some years ago, there was a millionaire. He was worth about $200 million. There were only dollars, but just handy money. He could buy food for the people of Musgrave for a good few years to come. And still he died himself because he didn't eat enough. Strange man. But our situation could turn out like it, you know. Jesus, because he has suffered for us and risen, he has made each one of us millionaires when it comes to his love and forgiveness. We have more love and forgiveness than we'll ever, ever need. It's there for the taking. 
but like how to use and his own wealth, it's for us to make it our own, to take it home, to take it into our hearts, so that we may be alive. That's what God wants for each of us. I suppose it was about the mid-fifties, I was fairly young at the time anyway, when we got the electricity here in Moscow. And it was a mighty change. The plugs were there and the bulbs were hanging from the ceiling for about three months in all place anyway and there was no life in them at all. And then one day we came home from school and my brother turned on the switch and the light lit. And the Lord knows any switch you turned on, there was a light. And plug almost anything into the wall and to do what was supposed to do. The radio was the best of all because up to then it was the wet battery and the dry battery and as sure as Adam, one of them would be giving trouble. It was a wonderful change, a change from the darkness to the light, it really was. One day I remember out in a stall having a pike of hay and I came in contact with the bulb hanging from the roof and of course it's supposed to hard to remember it all the time in the early days that there was such a thing and down came the bulb and I got a fairly bad fright because it would be hard to explain inside at home how that happened so I did my level best to put it up again and it wouldn't go so I put my finger up to see what was stopping it and I got some shock there didn't appear to be anything up there but there was and I knew it and I like to think of the current of God's love coming through to us the spirit of the risen Christ coming to, through to us as like that electricity, and like the electric current. And Jesus, he called us the lights of the world. He could very well have called us the bulbs of the world, but he was there before the electricity too, of course. And then there is the turning on of the switch, this turning on of the switch of this great life and current of God's Spirit. That is the switch of prayer, faithful prayer and faith-filled prayer, faithful prayer, well, trying to pray, that's all the best of us can ever do, trying to pray when maybe we feel that our prayers aren't up to much, and that's a temptation, because our prayers are always great, a few moments given to the Lord, he cherishes them. One time there was a, a hinge of two eggs. And she decided to hatch only one. Why? I don't know. But the egg she was hatching there every day under the warm wings of that hen. And every day life began to grow within that egg. Well, rather, it continued to grow within that egg. Until one day, it was all life. And the shell fell off. The other egg was out in the cold, to the glugger. And it's like that too when it comes to prayer. When we pray, we are, if you like, putting ourselves under the warm wings of the Lord, of God. And little by little, unnoticeably, perhaps, life grows within us. Until one day we'll be all life and the shell will fall away. Faith-filled prayer then, trying to pray with as much faith as we can, really believing. Jesus has told us that if you believe, well, then your prayer is effective. And there's no doubt that the greater our belief, the more powerful our prayer, the greater our trust. And then, going back to the bulbs again while I go on, it is strange that one bulb is 25 watt and another bulb 100 watt. Another one 200 watt. And why? 
Isn't it the same cotton, the same powders coming through in all three cases? And that's true. But there is a resistance built into the 25 watt, which is far greater than that in the 100 watt. And again, there's less resistance in the 200 watt bulb. And so the current is free to come in. And that's what lint is all about. It's all about the resistance within ourselves, within myself, that's keeping down the current of God's spirit of love which is coming into me. That's why I'm not shining as brightly as the Lord would like me to shine. And therefore I need lint. I need to repent and try to change all the time. Because it is in there that resistance. There was one couple, it is said anyway, I don't know whether it is true or not, but when the electricity came around, it said that they, the only time they ever turned on the light was to look for the candle. Jesus said, You are the light of the world, and do not hide yourself under a bushel, but be a source of encouragement to the people in your own home, to the people all those people whose lives you touch. And then around the same time of, as the electricity, I remember one day out in Rasheen, my mother went to McCroom, and she gave me one job to do while she was out, and that was to look after the cake in the oven. It was baking. And of course, being very busy as I was, I forgot altogether about it. And when my brother and myself went to the oven, we were too late. The cake had turned into a cinder. So we removed the remains and we buried them. And there was a bag of flour in under the stairs. So we said we'd have a go at trying to bake another. And it wasn't such a bad effort, but it wasn't up to the mark. And so it met the same fate as the first one. And a few more of them went to stay in us too. But I remember the last effort. And in fairness now we were rushing against the clock because my mother was due home fairly soon. And what happened was that I put the sour milk into the flour before the bread soda. And the bread soda would not mix because the flour was gone in a lump. It was gone hard in a lump. It couldn't mix. And the early fathers in the church described our Christian life, our Christian lives, in those terms. In terms of the Spirit of God's love mixing with my spirit. And of course the Spirit of God's love can't mix with my spirit if my spirit is sour. Soured by grudges, by my lack of forgiveness. God can't help me because I won't let him. I remember hearing a story about one man, and it has to do with forgiving from the heart. We sometimes think we've forgiven. You know, it's only from the teeth out, really. And this man, he went to confession. He was moving on a bit, and the priest told him he couldn't give him absolution unless he forgave his neighbor up the road. And, of course, the neighbor up the road, his father before him, hadn't spoken to the other man's father either. They were fighting. They were out with each other, not speaking, and they'd forgotten the reason why it was so. Then he said to the priest, the other father, he said, you wouldn't be that hard on me, I suppose. And the priest told him that there was no other way. It is the only way, he said, that God can come into you with his forgiveness. Then eventually the man, he gave up. He said, right, Father, he said, I, I'll do this, boss. But wait one second, I must go out now and have a chat out here. And he went out to his son, he was about 35 or 36. And he said to his son, you know, he said, I'm in a bit of a corner inside that. I won't get absolution unless I forgive so and so up the road. But look, he said to his son, I'm giving you one warning. Let you keep up the row, let you keep up the row. So we're called to forgive each other from the heart.
No, we sometimes worry whether our sins are forgiven. And that's a waste of time. That's God's business, and he's only too well able to do his business. Our business, especially during Lent, is that we forgive one another from the heart. And just as in the mid-50s, electricity came to Musgrave. We move from the darkness to the light. Let's hope that in the 80s, in 1987, Lent, we'll make a real effort to move from the darkness within us to the light, that light which Jesus is offering us most plentifully. It's flahul, more than we'll ever need of it. God is love, and he's mad about you. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. Reflection now, and uh, we had Father Jackie Corkery there. Um, Father Jackie always has a great way of delivering his message, I have to say. And um, he has, he's just compulsive listening. He, he really is. Um, when he has something to say, great sense of humour and a great, uh, a great way of delivering his message, as I see. Now here's an interview I did with uh, 